I want to introduce our next speaker. Hi, come on up. Buzzy Jackson. I knew her as a correspondent for the Boston Globe before I realized she wrote that awesome book, The Inspirational Atheist, that I didn't know I would love so very much. Um, Dr. Jackson is awesome, and I'm going to let her come and inspire us this evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Jackson wants the handheld mic. Can we get this mic turned on? And I assume I just go into the thing to find it. For you? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Do 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 do. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for hanging in there. It's been an awesome day. I know. Okay. Let's see here. Let's let you play from the start. Tech savvy woman right here. <laughs> I'm trying. That's awesome. All Yay. right, can you see it? Are you inspired yet? Um, thank you so much. It's a total honor to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, this the title of my talk was The Inspirational Atheist, colon, the working title of my book, which was Chicken Soup for the Soulless. Um, like Lucian, I really feel that um, the atheist world could use more affirmative statements for what we do believe in. And um, that's sort of what I tried to put together here. I think um, a couple months ago, my very nice Christian neighbor asked me what the title of my new book was. And I told her, and she was a little stunned, I think, because she hadn't probably seemingly met anybody who would tell her to her face that they were an atheist. And she stopped for a minute. And then she said, so you're an atheist. I mean, do you believe in anything? And I thought, you know what? That is a good question. That's a good question because we do believe in a lot of stuff. And actually, that's really what this book is about. Um, what is inspirational about atheism? And there's a lot. Uh, and let me just ask, I, I've talked to quite a few groups over the last few months. And a lot of times when I get up in front of them, it's at bookstores or whatever, I'm not actually sure I might be the only atheist in the room. So just for the fun of it, I just like to know, are there any atheists out there? Yes. <laughs> awesome. And let me just say to you uh, what the gentleman down in the Peabody Hotel Cafe said to me this morning when he saw my tag. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Good for us. So. I'm going to try and keep it light, uh, death, statistics, that kind of thing. Uh, it's getting into the evening. I don't want to be too heavy. So we will cover death, statistics, ethics, the enlightenment, and uh, what it means to be human. No biggie. First of all, death. Yay. Death. Death is important. It's an important thing for us to talk about as atheists because it's probably the single thing that distinguishes our belief system from that of religious people. That is to say, we believe in death, that it is actually real. Um, and that doesn't have to be a, an aggressive thought. It's simply uh, an acceptance and a courageous thought. It also gives meaning to life. As the great Emily Dickinson said, that it will never come again is what makes life so sweet. And she's right. As Catelyn Moran said, when, we, when everyone in the world admits they're going to die, we'll really start getting some stuff done. And that's patently obvious, but it's really poignant when you think about something like climate change. I mean, if you are waiting for the rapture to happen, there's no point in trying to solve any problem on this planet. Why would you? Why would you waste your time trying to deal with carbon emissions? You wouldn't. But if you believe that, that we're here just for a short period of time, you might. As the climate change activist said, the next one won't be biblical. <laughs> and by the way, the last one wasn't either. <laughs> to me, this slide, I probably don't even have to explain it to you. It's so self-evident, but it's so poignant and soothing. It's the first law of thermodynamics. Um, I could just leave it there, I guess, right? No, what, what's amazing about this law, it tells us something about a way to approach death. 
The first law of thermodynamics states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. We're in a finite system. And that means when you die, we all have electricity in us, right? We're all we're of the electric meat, that's humans. When we die, the energy simply changes form. And, but it stays within the system of the universe. Where else would it go? Uh, it's an interesting way to think about death as a passage of energy in that sense, and not in a woo-woo way, <laughs> in a real way. If you need a redemption story, I think Lawrence Krauss, the physicist's story, is a good one. The stars died so you could be here today. That's, that's a nice Easter quote. And as Terence McKenna put it, in I think a really nice translation of the first law of thermodynamics, nothing lasts, but nothing is lost. So statistics, another fun one. Um, I was an English major, so I really tried to avoid statistics a lot, most of my life. But in doing the research for this book and looking at thousands of years of what humanity's greatest thinkers have said about why life is wonderful and important from a non-religious point of view, I kept coming back to statistics, interestingly, and now I'm a fan. As Carl Sagan said, most of the species that have ever existed are now extinct. Extinction is the rule. Survival is the exception. And that means that all of us here in this room, we're very fortunate to be here. The odds are against us being here as individuals, even as a species. It's, it's kind of amazing we made it. As Robert Anton Wilson said, most of our ancestors were not perfect ladies and gentlemen. The majority of them weren't even mammals. <laughs> so feel glad we're in this form. And as a great science writer, Lewis Thomas, put it, statistically, the probability of any one of us being here is so small that you'd think the mere fact of existing would keep us all in a contented dazzlement of surprise. I love that quotation. I would love to um, pretend that I walk around every day in a state of contented dazzlement. Um, I don't, but it actually has improved my life to read that quote a lot and, and remember the significance of it. As the great atheist agitator Robert Ingersoll said, in nature there are neither rewards nor punishments, there are consequences. Again, statistically, the reason we're here is not because we deserve to be here more than somebody who died two weeks ago deserved it, or that our ancestors were more deserving. We're simply here as a consequence of events, which, of course, brings us to ethics consequences. I think, as all of you here in this room know, there's a misunderstanding often among religious people that religion is necessary in order to lead an ethical or morally upright life. Now, we know that's clearly not true. Um, in fact, I think sometimes what happens is that people make out ethics to be much more complicated than it is. It's really, it's really quite simple. As Karl Reiner, the great comic writer, wrote, there are far too many commandments and you really only need one. Do not hurt anybody. Kind of comes down to that. As Linus Pauling, the great Nobel winning scientist said, I have something that I call my golden rule. It goes something like this. Do unto others 25% better than you expect them to do unto you. The 25% is for error. <laughs> Back to statistics. What I love about that is that Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes, one for science and one for peace, figured out a way to actually improve upon what's probably the most universal law of morality uh, in our species. So on to enlightenment, or as I actually prefer, the enlightenment. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado. It's a place where a lot of people like to talk about enlightenment. Um, they typically talk about stuff like this, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> and that's fine, but I think it's much more helpful and useful to talk about the enlightenment, stuff like this. Um, the reason is because so much of what is good and right and better about the time we live in now is a direct result 
of the Enlightenment, the abolition of slavery, the women's right to vote. A hundred years ago in this country, women did not have that right. Um, these are all products of the Enlightenment. And as Immanuel Kant wrote in his great essay, What is Enlightenment? So per aude, dare to know, have the courage to use your own understanding is the motto of the Enlightenment. And I think most of us are familiar with the idea that uh, enlightenment is about using your own understanding. But I do want to highlight one word in this quotation that I think is so important and often overlooked. And the word is courage. It often takes courage to use your own understanding. It's not always easy. You get a lot of flack for it. As the great 20th century philosopher and union organizer Eric Hoffer said, humanity came of age when men asked the first question. And I do think it's that spirit of questioning, questioning established truths, questioning what we see around us. It's true that it seems like the sun goes around the earth, but it was a good thing that we questioned it, wasn't it? So what does it mean to be human, to ask those questions? This is an image of El Castillo Cave in Spain. These are as of 2015, the oldest cave paintings we know of. They're about 41,000 years old. Now, what I love about these paintings is that, first of all, aesthetically, they're so beautiful, and we can all easily recognize how gorgeous those are. Um, but they also represent a kind of self-portrait of human beings 40,000 years ago who were biologically identical to all of us in this room. They just, their culture was in a different place. And to me, what these paintings represent is people who took some time out of their day of you know, hunting, gathering, hitting things with sticks, uh, to make an impression of themselves in the world they lived in. This is, I think, directly relates to what Hoffer said about man's desire to ask the first question. These are people with the desire, this is a, a species with the desire to not just survive in this world, but to understand it. And to me, that's really central, I think, to our identity as a species. Things like Stonehenge. Um, we don't even know to this day exactly what Stonehenge was for, although it seems to have some astronomical significance. But thousands of years later, we can look at it and still realize, you know, these people, probably their time could have been better spent preparing food or building houses, but they chose to do this because they wanted to really understand this world around them, to understand the skies above them. And then obviously, what has to follow Stonehenge, Carhenge. Um, has anybody here ever been to Carhenge? Yes, nice Carhenge visitors. I am very happy to say that last week I made my second visit to Carhenge. It's in Alliance, Nebraska, which is technically in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it, is, it was created um, in 1987 by a farmer whose father had just died. And when asked why he did it, he said, I just thought he would have found it really funny. <laughs> and I love that about our species, that we are ridiculous, basically. Um, Carhenge is modeled exactly on Stonehenge, so if you go to an equinox, you can see the sun rise between two Buicks, you know. It, it's amazing. I, I, I really recommend it. If you're going to Mount Rushmore, it's not too far from there. Um, Galileo, to get back to the sort of observation and the courage to use your understanding. These are some of Galileo's early sketches of the moon. Now, you know, Galileo did not only observe the planets and the moon, he built his own telescopes to see them. And when he did, he made some drawings of what he saw. And a lot of times we get stuck on the idea that Galileo got in trouble because of the whole sun, earth going around the sun issue. But it wasn't just that. These sketches were a big part of it because what they showed was a moon with a lot of bumpy crevices and craters on it. And that in itself was a threat to the Catholic Church. The church leaders said, the moon is a heavenly sphere. Everything in heaven is perfect. Therefore, there must not be any imperfections on the moon. Therefore, these sketches are blasphemous. Galileo 
kind of shrugged and said, I just call them like I see them. <laughs> this, look for yourself, which they refused to do. And, but people kept looking. I mean, he suffered for it, but he couldn't, they couldn't really quench that desire to know. After all, as the English scientist J.B.S. Haldane said, there's no great invention from fire to flying, which has not been hailed as an insult to some god. People were interested in this moon thing, and they kept looking into it. And the Catholic Church kind of got over the imperfection thing, which if you notice, they tend to have a tendency to do over time, get over things that at first seemed like the world would end. Um, we, wanted, we wanted to know more about the moon. And as President Kennedy said in 1962, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that is what we do as a species. You think building Stonehenge was easy? It was not easy. We still don't know how they did it. And I f I'm going to show you the next slide. I will tell you in advance that it's not from a real newspaper, but I do feel that it's the only newspaper headline that has ever ac accurately captured uh, the true feeling of this achievement. Um, <laughs> holy shit, man walks on the fucking moon. Um, that happened nine years after Kennedy said we were going to try and go. And just a few hundred years after Galileo first looked through that telescope. Um, it's totally fucking amazing that we actually stood on that thing. And I will say, wherever you live in the United States, um, moon rocks were passed out to every state in the nation. Uh, and every state has one somewhere. In, I live in Colorado, and I've seen our moon rock. And I go to, the, to see it every so often. I really urge you to go try and see a moon rock because they're just tiny little gray rocks. But go there, stand in the presence of it, and actually try to comprehend what you are looking at. You are looking at a piece of that thing up there that people have been staring at since the time of those cave paintings. The biologically identical people to those cave painting people made it up to the fucking moon. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I'm a fan of the whole moon thing, you can tell. Um, as Jim Lovell said, from now on, we live in a world where man has walked on the moon. And it's not a miracle. We just decided to go. We didn't get there because we prayed that we would get to the moon. We did not get there because we were deserving of some supernatural intervention that got us to the moon. And we did not get to the moon because we were good. We got there because we made some fucking lists and checked off all the boxes and did all those hard calculations. That's how it happened. It's not a miracle. That's the only way anything's gotten done. As Neil deGrasse Tyson says, science, it's true whether or not you believe in it. That's why it works. Sorry, Catholic Church. <laughs> so from this handprint to Neil Armstrong's footprint, to me, those are two amazing self-portraits of humankind. Now, the handprint has lasted for 41,000 years so far. That moon print, or footprint on the moon in the Sea of Tranquility, you know, there's no wind on the moon. So unless a Chinese spaceship lands on it, uh, which could happen, um, it could conceivably be there until the moon goes away, which could be billions of years. And I really can't think of a better monument, really, to humankind's desire to ask questions. We have gotten further from the moon, of course. Uh, we got to Mars, our spacecraft did. That photo, you may have seen it. It was taken a little over a year ago. Earth is that tiny little speck in the sky. What I love about this photo is that we're all in it. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> My house looks really clean from this perspective. Um, it's amazing that we've gotten stuff that far away. And it's truly a way of getting perspective on ourselves and our place in the universe. 
Now, you've probably seen this poster maybe in a dorm room. It's kind of a classic. And I think some people interpret this as, oh, we're insignificant and thus meaningless. We're so tiny in the face of this giant thing. Um, I really think there's a better, a different way to look at it. Um, and if you're an atheist, I think it's easier to look at it this way than maybe if you're religious. Um, we are all, each of us, and collectively, a part, a small part, of the biggest thing that has ever existed, the universe. We are a part of that universe. And as Alan Watts said, you and I are all, are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. You can't take a wave out of the ocean and have it make sense. There's no context for that. You can't take us out of that universe and have that make sense. We're part of it. We're huge in that sense. As Carl Sagan said, we, humans, are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Or as the physicist Niels Bohr was purportedly said, a physicist is just an atom's way of looking at itself. <laughs> I like that. I quote a lot of physicists in this book. Um, and you know, I know this has been, we've covered some deep topics, death, statistics, our place in the universe, but you know, I would like to end on something a little bit lighter, and yet no, no less true. If you ever start taking life too seriously, just remember that we're talking monkeys on an organic spaceship flying through the universe. Thank you.